Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. So, this was a buddy read. I read this with Sophisticated Books. Definitely check out her channel. Can't wait to see what she makes of it, actually. We've been talking about it on Twitter. So yeah, be sure to check out Sophie's channel to see what she thought of it as well. I just want to quickly, before I get into this, let you know about some changes to the way that I'm doing reviews. So I'm still going to do these more in-depth reviews, and of course I'm going to go in-depth on The Handmaid's Tale. But I'm going to do less in-depth ones for other books that are kind of, I guess, less important. And we're going to release bundles of reviews in one video. So it's the Archive 5, and there'll be five reviews per video in those. But I do still want to do, you know, more in-depth reviews specifically for buddy reads and for books that just deserve talking about. And this definitely fits the bill. So let me read you the blurb here. The Republic of Gilead offers Offred only one option, to breed. If she deviates, she will, like all dissenters, be hanged at the wall or sent out to die slowly of radiation sickness. But even a repressive state cannot obliterate desire, neither Offred's nor that of the two men on which her future hangs. Brilliantly conceived and executed, this powerful evocation of 21st century America gives full reign to Margaret Atwood's devastating irony, wit and astute perception. The first thing, actually, is the fact that it's the Republic of Gilead. Now, I don't know how often that word is used. I mean, it does seem like a fairly typical kind of fantasy-style name. But I'm sure it was Gilead that Roland the Gunslinger was from in Stephen King's Dark Tower series. And I'm pretty sure he wrote at least the first book of that before this as well. So I don't know. Hey, Google. What is Gilead? So it's just a biblical name, basically, is, is what we're going for. Okay, so I am going to go through it and check out some of my little sticky tabs, see what uh, caught my attention. And we'll talk it through and then I'll give a rating at the end. Now what Sophie and I were both talking about is that in contrast to maybe some other dystopian novels, this one does actually... You know, it starts with the story and the world building happens while the story's going on. So you never feel as though nothing's happened and you're just being told stuff. You're constantly experiencing the story and that's, you know, you see the world through the story. And what I quite like is even just some of the bits of dialogue and the, you know, the semantics and the meaning of things. They've been very carefully thought out as well. So I'm going to just read this little paragraph here. Fraternise means to behave like a brother. Luke told me that. He said there was no corresponding word that meant to behave like a sister. Sororize, it would have to be, he said, from the Latin. He liked knowing about such details, the derivations of words, curious usages. I used to tease him about being pedantic. Luke sounds like the kind of person that I would like, but equally, obviously Luke is our main character's uh, husband from before the event, I guess. And one of the things that's really interesting about The Handmaid's Tale is that all the events of the book take place not too long after the descent into this dystopian world so we're at a point where the characters can remember a time before it and I think that makes it really interesting. Something similar happened in a different book I was reading recently. I was reading Soviet Milk by Nora Ekstainer who is a Latvian author and there was a thing there with the characters where it was set during the Soviet occupation but some of the characters, the older ones, could remember the time before the Soviet occupation whereas the younger ones, it was all they knew, all they'd grown with, you know. And um, I do think having, I read this after I just got back from Latvia and learned a lot about the Russian and the German occupation of Latvia and you can tell that the Russians and the Germans and their ethos has, has gone into this book. I mean, I think even more so potentially the Nazis and their, their take on um, eugenics and things like that and selective breeding and all this stuff. It's very much this book is a product of that without it just feeling like an imitation. It feels like, you know, basically some shitty things have happened between people in our world and sometimes you know the truth is scarier than fiction and what Atwood's done is taken the truth turned it into fiction and made it even scarier than that like it's madness it's madness so here we go a little bit of world building here for example so Offred is going to the shops and uh, it says here as she's on the way there she's thinking about something last week they shot a woman right about here she was a Martha she was fumbling in her robe for her pass, and they thought she was hunting for a bomb. They thought she was a man in disguise. There have been such incidents. Rita and Cora knew the woman. I heard them talking about it in the kitchen. Doing their job, said Cora, keeping us safe. 
Nothing safer than dead, said Rita angrily. She was minding her own business. No call to shoot her. And I think the dialogue between the characters is potentially what makes this book. It's how you get to see... Well, I, it's interesting because, again, they're living in this dystopia, so everything has to be really carefully thought out before you said it. You can't just go and say what you think. You have to, you know, think about it before you say it, which means that, to a certain extent, you can never know what the other characters are thinking, which is how it was in real life during the Soviet period as well. Nobody liked talking to strangers because they never know if they knew if they'd be an agent, agent you know. So a little bit more here as well, a little bit more world building. The one with the moustache opens the small pedestrian gate for us and stands back well out of the way and we pass through. As we walk away, I know they're watching, these two men who aren't yet permitted to touch women. They touch with their eyes instead and I move my hips a little, feeling the full red skirt sway around me. It's like thumbing your nose from behind a fence or teasing a dog with a bone held out of reach and I'm ashamed of myself for doing it because none of this is the fault of these men, they're too young. Then I find I'm not ashamed after all. I enjoy the power. Power of a dog bone. Passive, but there. I hope they get hard at the sight of us and have to rub themselves against the painted barriers surreptitiously. They will suffer later at night in their regimented beds. They have no outlets now except themselves, and that's a sacrilege. There are no more magazines, no more films, no more substitutes. Only me and my shadow walking away from the two men who stand at attention stiffly by a roadblock watching our retreating shapes. And I think that's interesting because it's the only way that Offred has power and, and the women in this book. The only way that they have any form of power is through their bodies. And actually, she's worried in this book because she's heading towards the menopause and once she's no longer of reproductive age, you know, in this world, you are in trouble. But I think I like that little, that little scene there because I think it shows, you know... You can't blame her for doing that because, again, it's the only way she has any form of power or control. So you would exercise it and you would feel guilty about it as well, you know. Um, but equally, it highlights the fact that actually the men in this dystopia, they're not much better off than the women in terms of their social standing and their power and stuff. It's very much the few at the top get everything they need and everyone else is screwed over. But even... You know, even the, the men in positions of power in this book tend to actually not be too happy. And I think that is a good thing. I, I like the way that Atwood's done it like that. It's, 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 it's not a case of just, just men taking advantage of women or whatever. Sure, it's a patriarchal system and they're expected to a certain extent to take advantage of women or whatnot. You know, to have their handmaids and to inseminate them and all this stuff. But actually, it's still not a very nice system to live with, and I think that just goes to show that the patriarchy is just bad. Like, it hurts men as well, and I think this is what a lot of people don't realise in this day and age. We get, you know, and, and this is why this book is actually super relevant still now, because the gender wars are very much a thing. I actually, it makes me really sad. Like, I see people arguing on Twitter and on YouTube and all this stuff, and it's like, you're actually on the same side. I liked as well, so the shops are now known by their signs alone. They're not allowed branding or titles or anything like that. So if they're selling bread, they put a little bit of, you know, a bread sign out in the window. Same with, like, the fish shop. It's usually closed because there usually isn't any. And again, this reminds me of rationing and, you know, bread lines and things like that during the Soviet period. All right, let's read this paragraph here. The night is mine, my own time, to do with as I will, as long as I am quiet, as long as I don't move, as long as I lie still. The difference between lie and lay. Lay is always passive. Even men used to say, I'd like to get laid, though sometimes they said, I'd like to lay her. All this is pure speculation. I don't really know what men used to say. I had only their words for it. Okay, then we have... Um, some nice bit here. I'd like to believe this is a story I'm telling. I need to believe it. I must believe it. Those who can believe that such stories are only stories have a better chance. If it's a story I'm telling, then I have control over the ending. Then there will be an ending to the story and real life will come after it. I can pick up where I left off. It isn't a story I'm telling. It's also a story I'm telling in my head as I go along. I'm just going to read this little bit as well, which I think is fascinating. I walk around to the back door, open it, go in, set my basket down on the kitchen table. The table has been scrubbed off, cleared of flour. Today's bread, freshly baked, is cooling on its rack. The kitchen smells of yeast, a nostalgic smell. It reminds me of other kitchens, kitchens that were mine. It smells of mothers, although my own mother did not make bread. It smells of me in former times when I was a mother. This is a treacherous smell, and I know I must shut it out. 
And it goes there again, the power of like thought control and the mind police. It does have a lot of elements of books like 1984 in this, but actually I will say here for the record, I enjoyed this more than 1984. And I'm an Orwell fan. I like here as well. So she finds herself in this room, which is basically her new house is where she's going to live. And um, I like the contrast of the old to the new here. So someone has lived in this room before me. Someone like me, or I prefer to believe so. I discovered it three days after I was moved here. I had a lot of time to pass. I decided to explore the room, not hastily as one would explore a hotel room, expecting no surprise, opening and shutting the desk drawers, the cupboard doors, unwrapping the tiny individually wrapped bar of soap, prodding the pillows. Will I ever be in a hotel room again? How I wasted them, those rooms, that freedom from being seen. Oh yeah, we have this, um, throughout we have this little bit of Latin that the main character's trying to figure out and it says, Nolite te bastardes carborundum. And this character throughout she's like what does this mean what does this mean and I don't know whether you're supposed to figure it out as a reader or not but for me it was this really it was kind of underwhelming dramatic irony where the character didn't know what it meant and I'm just like it means don't let the bastards grind you down like I don't speak or read Latin or anything but I can figure it out <laughs> we have part of the book again getting quite deep here so she's she says is that how we lived then but we lived as usual. Everyone does most of the time. Whatever is going on is as usual. Even this is as usual now. We lived as usual by ignoring. Ignoring isn't the same as ignorance. You have to work at it, which is true. We have the fact that sterility is forbidden. So if a woman gets preg it doesn't get pregnant, it's clearly not the man's fault. No, it must be the woman's fault. So we have the workaround where everyone kind of knows that people do actually become sterile through no fault of their own. And so sometimes the women and the handmaids have to get pregnant by the doctors because otherwise they will be killed, basically. And, I, you know, you can call this a feminist book and whatnot, but actually I think, again, it, for me, it's just a tale about people being awful to people and setting up these, you know, totalitarian governments and all this stuff that are just bad and they're just are bad for people. We're not very good at looking after other people. We have someone who disobeys and gets punished here and it says here, They took her into a room that used to be the science lab. It was a room where none of us ever went willingly. Afterwards, she could not walk for a week. Her feet would not fit into her shoes. They were too swollen. It was the feet they'd do for a first offence. They used steel cables frayed at the ends. After that, the hands. They didn't care what they did to your feet and hands, even if it was permanent. Remember, said Aunt Lydia, for our purposes, your feet and your hands are not essential. Which is sad, but also, you can totally see where she's coming from there. We have a line here as well when she's thinking about the past. It does jump uh, from the, the past to the present and back again every now and then. And sometimes it is disconcerting, but if you just keep reading, you can, you know, you can power through. And that also means that you get sections like these where there's, you know, a, an empty page as you go into the next section. So it actually, for me, it made me feel as though I was really whizzing through it. Let's read this chap paragraph here. So, but this is wrong. Nobody dies from lack of sex. It's lack of love we die from. There's nobody here I can love. All the people I could love are dead or elsewhere. Who knows where they are or what their names are now? They might as well be nowhere as I am for them. I too am a missing person. And I think that, you know, the dividing line between love and sex is very important. And I don't think as a society we think about it enough. And then we get this moment where you can kind of tell it's going to happen. The commander of the house she's in kind of wants to see her in private. And, uh, but it turns out he wants to play Scrabble, which I think is great. And he can't ask his wife because she'd think it's weird. So, so he has to ask the handmaid because then they're both basically in as much much trouble as each other if if she gets caught. And it does develop from there. And one thing I would say, one complaint I did have for this book is that ultimately, even at the end, this isn't a tale about you know Offred as a strong woman forging her own destiny. It's a tale of Offred eventually hooking up with a couple of guys and getting caught and getting into trouble. So. It's actually not that feminist. I, I think I would have preferred it if she, you know what I mean? If, if the tale had progressed from start to finish without her necessarily getting to the end be, by dint of the fact that she was a woman, you know, I would have liked to have seen her, I guess, rebel a bit more. A bit like her friend, I think her friend was called Myra. I kind of feel as though instead of seeing The Handmaid's Tale, I would have liked to have seen Myra's tale, but. So we have the commander here, he has this great line of dialogue, which is very Orwellian, he says, 
What's dangerous in the hands of the multitudes? Oh, hang on. Let me read that again. Right, so sometimes Atwood's comma usage is really odd. She puts commas in places where I don't think there should be commas. And so it kind of makes it hard to read quite often because you're like, you're reading and then you suddenly jump. You know, you're like, what? Like, just then I tried to read this 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 uh, short paragraph out and I got confused by the commas. Okay. What's dangerous in the hands of the multitudes, he said, with what may or may not have been irony, is safe enough for those whose motives are beyond reproach, I said. We have uh, Offred thinking about the past and she says, All those women having jobs. Hard to imagine now, but thousands of them had jobs. Millions. It was considered the normal thing. Now it's like remembering the paper money when they still had that. My mother kept some of it, pasted into her scrapbook along with the early photos. It was obsolete by then, you couldn't buy anything with it. Pieces of paper, thickish, greasy to the touch, green coloured, with pictures on each side. Some old man in a wig and on the other side a pyramid with an eye above it. It said, in God we trust. My mother said people used to have signs beside their cash registers for a joke. In God we trust, all others pay cash. That would be blasphemy now. And what's sad is that women eventually became made kind of unpeople, so all their money was just taken away immediately. It just automatically became the property of their husband. And you know, when you're dealing with a credit card society, that would be devastating. And um, I don't know. I just think a lot of the stuff in this is a warning that we have to make sure that old President Trump doesn't get too excited with those executive orders of his. I have a opening paragraph here, which I think is great. Night falls or has fallen. Why is it the night falls instead of rising like the dawn? Yet if you look east at sunset, you can see night rising, not falling. Darkness lifting into the sky, up from the horizon, like a black sun behind cloud cover. Like smoke from an unseen fire, a line of fire just below the horizon, brush fire or a burning city. Maybe night falls because it's heavy, a thick curtain pulled up over the eyes, wool blanket. I wish I could see in the dark better than I do. There's also a sad moment when so back in the past her and her husband decide to basically make a run for it and they have to take care of the cat because they can't take the cat with them and if they throw it out then the cat will you know lurk outside the door and it will start meowing there and that will attract attention so they have to take care of the cat and I don't know about anyone else but even if I was fleeing f for my life from an oppressive regime I would take Biggie with me even though he hates going in the car some interesting dialogue here, so, uh, it means you can't cheat nature, he says. Nature demands variety for men. It stands to reason, it's part of the procreational strategy. It's nature's plan. I don't say anything, so he goes on. Women know that instinctively. Why did they buy so many different clothes in the old days? To trick the men into thinking they were several different women, a new one each day. He says this as if he believes it, but he says many things that way. Maybe he believes it, maybe he doesn't, or maybe he does both at the same time. Impossible to tell what he believes. She has a black bow tie around her neck and is wearing black net stockings and black high heels. She always hated high heels. The whole costume, antique and bizarre, reminds me of something from the past, but I can't think what. A stage play? A musical comedy? Girls dressed for Easter in rabbit suits? What is the significance of it here? Why are rabbits supposed to be sexually attractive to men? How can this bedraggled costume appeal? Okay, so I asked... I asked my girlfriend this, I was like, why why do girls dress up like bunnies? Because I've seen it before, for Halloween, very odd, I don't know, I don't really dress up that much, apart from when I'm doing punk rock tags on booktube, so, um, but she says she thinks it might be because of the Playboy bunnies, and it could be, that could be the significance. I quite like the, there are a lot of ambiguous endings in this, and I think that for me as a reader I like that. I know a lot of people really don't like that but I like being able to decide for myself what happened. So a good example of, of, of it is here with her friend Moira. So here is what I'd like to tell. I'd like to tell a story about how Moira escaped for good this time. Or if I couldn't tell that I'd like to say she blew up Jezebels with 50 commanders inside it. I'd like her to end with something daring and spectacular, some outrage, something that would be fitter. But as far as I know that didn't happen. I don't know how she ended or even if she did because I never saw her again. Jezebel's, by the way, is the name of basically a brothel for the commanders, and that's, again, a biblical reference. There are a lot of biblical references in this. It even feels kind of biblical in the way that it's told. Let me read you the end lines of the actual novel, because I love this as an ending. The van waits in the driveway. Its double doors stand open. The two of them, one on either side now, take me by the elbows to help me in. 
Whether this is my end or a new beginning, I have no way of knowing. I have given myself over into the hands of strangers because it can't be helped. And so I step up into the darkness within, or else the light. And what I like about that, again, it's an ambiguous ending. Basically, she, the people in the van are either good guys, effectively, members of the resistance who are going to get her out of there, or she's handing herself over to the bad guys and she's going to in for a, a swift, sharp drop and then a sudden stop, as they say. But then, we then have historical notes on The Handmaid's Tale as like, uh, almost an appendix, I guess. And it's basically the transcript of a lecture and it's all these old white dudes. Thank you, I am sure we all enjoyed our charming arctic char last night at dinner and now we are enjoying an equally charming arctic chair. I use the word enjoy in two distinct senses, precluding, of course, the obsolete third. But let me be serious. I wish, as the title of my little chat implies, to consider some of the problems associated with the soy distant manuscript which is well known to all of you by now, and which goes by the title of The Handmaid's Tale. I say soy distant because what we have before us is not the item in its original form. Strictly speaking, it was not a manuscript at all when first discovered and bore no title. The superscription The Handmaid's Tale was appointed to it by Professor Wade, partly in homage to the great Geoffrey Chaucer. But those of you who know Professor Wade informally, as I do, will understand when I say that I am sure all puns were intentional, particularly that having to do with the archaic vulgar signification of the word tale, that being to some extent the bone, as it were, of contention in that phase of Giladian society of which our saga treats. The item, I hesitate to use the word document, was unearthed on the side of what was once of Bangor in what, at the time prior to the inception of the Galadian regime, would have been called the State of Maine. We know that this city was a prominent way station on what our author refers to as the Underground Female Road, since dubbed by some of our historical wags the Underground Frail Road. For this reason our association has taken a particular interest in it. But basically what it goes on to explain is that these are all tapes, it says here, there were some 30 tapes in the collection altogether with varying proportions of music to spoken word. In general, each tape begins with two or three songs, as camouflage no doubt. Then the music is broken off and the speaking voice takes over. The voice is a woman's and, according to our voice print experts, the same one throughout. The labels on the cassettes were authentic period labels, dating of course, from some time before the inception of the early Gilead era, as all such secular music was banned under the regime. There were, for instance, four tapes entitled Elvis Presley's Golden Years, three of Folk Songs of Lithuania, three of Boy George Takes It Off, and two of Mantovani's Mellow Strings, as well as some titles that sported a mere single tape each. Twisted Sister at Carnegie Hall is one of which I'm particularly fond. So that's interesting because it puts in a context of stuff that we would recognise. I also find it interesting that one of the, the three of them were folk songs of Lithuania because Lithuania was one of the Baltic countries and like I said I'd just come back from Latvia and saw a lot of the influence of the Soviet occupation there and the Soviets also occupied Lithuania. So I wonder if that's a little nod to that there. But I just didn't like that as an appendix. I preferred the ending as it was. This new ending sort of changes the way you look at the book I guess. But I just didn't think it was as good of an ending. But still, I absolutely love this book. I gave it a 5 out of 5. I think it's a strong contender for my book of the year so far this year. I don't know if there are any that can beat it. Like I said, I even preferred it to 1984. I mean, it's my favourite dystopian now. And I like George Orwell a lot. <laughs> so I've read all of his other books, for example. So, so yeah. Definitely check out The Handmaid's Tale. Big up to Sophisticated Books for reading this one with me and making me actually pick it up as well. Hopefully you've enjoyed this review. Hit that like button if you have. Hit subscribe if you're new here and you would like to see more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.